on the surface, the decade of the 1920s was golden for the United States, and there was genuine prosperity in the 20s. However, it turned out that the prosperity boom of the 20s rested on a very shaky foundation, and at the end of the decade, the whole house came crashing down. Most people are familiar with the great crash on Wall Street, which took place at the end of October 1929, and that was the most amazing phenomenon of its kind ever, with um, billions of dollars being lost in less than a month. But in a truly healthy economy, even a phenomenon like the Great Crash should not have ruined the economy. As it turned out, the economy was not nearly as healthy as most people had thought in the 20s to begin with. And so the Great Crash basically served as the triggering mechanism for what soon evolved into the most catastrophic economic depression in American history. The causes of the Great Depression, the underlying causes, are still debated to some extent, although I think there are some things that almost all economists and economic historians agree on. First of all, the wealth of the nation was very unevenly distributed. Uh, management reaped most of the benefits of increased productivity in the 20s instead of workers and consumers. What this meant, among other things, was that the consumer sector of the economy was weaker than it should have been. There was simply not enough purchasing power in the pockets of American consumers, and in an economy that was increasingly driven by consumption, that was a fundamental underlying weakness. Another cause of the Depression, or certainly one of the factors that made it worse, was the fact that it was a global depression. And so nothing the United States did by itself could necessarily get us out of the mess. There were a lot of complicated international economic issues during uh, the 20s, but certainly one thing that did not help was that the United States in the 20s uh, jacked the tariff on imported goods up to record levels. This, of course, had several uh, negative consequences, but one thing that it did, of course, was to invite the European powers to retaliate by placing high tariffs on things that they imported from the United States. So we basically had a trade war, uh, and it added to the bad blood that already existed between the United States and its uh, allies from World War I, especially Britain and France. The United States had loaned a lot of money to the allies during World War I and now insisted that all the money be repaid. The Europeans, to some extent, didn't think they ought to have to pay the United States back because they felt that they had paid in blood. But they also argued that it would be easier for them to pay their war debts if they could sell more easily in the American market. But the high tariff policy of the Republicans in the 20s made that difficult. Also, Germany, uh, the defeated power in World War I, was stuck with a huge war reparations bill by the Treaty of Versailles and Germany claimed that they could not pay those reparations unless they got some assistance. And so the United States loaned money to Germany so that Germany could pay their reparations payments to the British and the French, and the British and the French then used the money they got from Germany to try to pay off the debt they owed the United States. But this whole house of cards crashed down after the uh, stock market crash and the onset of the Depression in 1930 and 31. So the international nature of the Depression uh, made getting out from under it much more difficult. Another underlying cause of the Depression was the lack of government regulation of business and banking practices. Most of the regulatory agencies that had been set up by the progressives in the early 20th century, such as the Federal Trade Commission, still existed, but they were largely ineffective, mainly because they were staffed with pro-business conservatives who weren't interested in doing much regulating. The stock market was completely unregulated, so a lot of things happened on Wall Street in the 20s that were later made illegal, though at the time they were not. And uh, there was relatively little uh, regulation of the banking industry as well. And a fourth underlying cause of the Great Depression was weaknesses in various sectors of the American economy, especially the agricultural sector. In fact, American agriculture was depressed before the Depression. 
uh, farmers were largely left out of the prosperity boom of the 1920s. And even though the economy has shifted to a predominantly industrial-based economy, agriculture is still a very important part of it. So if the farm sector is depressed, that is a fundamental weakness in the overall economy. Also, the housing sector of the economy, while booming early in the 20s, uh, was depressed by the end of the decade. And perhaps as much as anything, the whole consumer sector was weaker than it should have been because of the bad distribution of income. At any rate, uh, after the great crash, and I think the main role that the great stock market crash played in triggering the depression was that it destroyed the confidence of the business community. Uh, many businessmen became so demoralized by the huge losses on Wall Street that they decided to close down plants, lay off workers, and of course that only contributed to the uh, downward spiral. And as the depression set in with unemployment by 1931-32 reaching at least 25 percent, and in many areas it was much higher than that, and of course homelessness became widespread as well, the man caught in the middle was President Herbert Hoover. Hoover was an intelligent man, widely respected, uh, who at any other time in American history might have made a good president, but he seemed completely incapable of dealing uh, with the uh, economic crisis of the early 30s. In 1928, Hoover had won in a landslide over the Democratic candidate Al Smith, governor of New York. We talked a little bit last time about some of the baggage that Smith carried, being the son of immigrant parents, a Roman Catholic and an opponent of prohibition. But the fact is, even if Smith had been a teetotaling Baptist from Alabama, he would have had a very difficult time beating Herbert Hoover in 1928 because the Republicans were taking credit for the prosperity boom. Now, just four years later, the Republicans are being blamed for the Depression. Smith expected to get the Democratic nomination since he had carried the banner in a hopeless cause in 1928. Now he expects to be the Democratic nominee in 1932 when it's going to be hard for any Democrat to lose. But he was outmaneuvered at the Democratic convention by his own political protege, the current governor of New York, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Roosevelt came away from the Democratic convention with the nomination. And in 1932, Roosevelt would crush Hoover in a landslide. In fact, uh, Hoover experienced the biggest reversal of fortune in four years of any president, winning by a landslide in 1928 but being swept out of office in an even bigger landslide four years later. And of course, uh, the overwhelming reason for that was the catastrophic economic depression. Roosevelt, when he accepted the Democratic nomination in 1932, and he did it in person, which was breaking with tradition, and of course Roosevelt would break many precedents during his time in office, most notably the two-term tradition, when Roosevelt addressed the Democratic Convention in Chicago in 1932 to accept the nomination, he said, I pledge you, meaning the Democratic Party, I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. The press picked up on that, and so Roosevelt's entire domestic program became known as the New Deal. Now, exactly what the New Deal would consist of, Roosevelt was not entirely sure of in 1932, and to some extent that was intentional. What Roosevelt wanted to do more than anything was to restore confidence, which he was able to do uh, through his masterful use of the radio, among other things. But he also believed that more than anything, the country needed to try new things. And so basically, he's willing to try almost anything to get the country out of the Depression. And if it didn't work, he would scrap it and try something else. So there really is no overall driving philosophy behind the New Deal. But at any rate, uh, no president ever took office under worse circumstances than Roosevelt in 1933, with the possible exception of Lincoln in 1861. And by the time Roosevelt was inaugurated on March 4, 1933, four-fifths of all the banks in the country were closed. Uh, many banks had failed, and that caused a panic, which led many people to race down to their banks to take their money out, which, of course, threatened the health of even the sound banks. The reason for this, as much as anything, was that there was no deposit insurance. So if you had your money in a bank that collapsed, you lost everything you had. So one of Roosevelt's first official actions after taking, president, uh, taking the presidency was to order 
all the banks in the country to close until further notice. Uh, he euphemistically referred to this as a bank holiday, but what he's trying to do is end the runs on banks that threaten the collapse of the entire financial structure of the nation. And a couple of days after ordering the bank holiday, Roosevelt went on the radio and delivered the first of his so-called fireside chats to the American people. He explained the situation in terms that most Americans could understand. He explained why he had ordered the bank holiday. He explained what steps the government was taking to ensure the safety of their bank deposits. And he said, your money is safer in the bank than it is stuffed under the mattress. And this helped to restore confidence in the system. And the fact is, most of the banks in the country were sound. And as soon as government inspectors had determined that they were sound, they were allowed to reopen. Uh, those that were not sound, the government took steps to try to prop them up. But the immediate crisis passed. Still, Roosevelt has a mountain of problems on his plate. And over the next several years, he will, uh, working with uh, huge Democratic majorities in both houses of Congress, reshape the American economy in ways that uh, have affected the country ever since. Now, one question that's often asked is, did the New Deal end the Great Depression? I think for the most part, the answer to that is no, if by ending the Depression you mean restoring full employment. What did that was World War II. However, the New Deal did put in place a number of programs that eased the suffering in the 1930s, and perhaps most importantly, created some permanent agencies and programs uh, that made the likelihood of a depression of that magnitude uh, less. In fact, we've had stock market crashes worse than the one in 1929, but for a variety of reasons, including some of the safeguards that were put in as part of the New Deal, they have generally not led to a major depression, and certainly nothing like the Depression of the 1930s. The New Deal did, however, see a great expansion of the power of the federal government, including into areas that the government had never played much of a role in before, including social welfare matters. During the New Deal, Dozens and dozens of new federal agencies and programs were created, most of them represented with an acronym. So it is with the New Deal of the 1930s that we get this proliferation of alphabet agencies. Almost all of the New Deal agencies, however, could be grouped under one of three categories, sometimes referred to as the three R's, relief, recovery, and reform. Relief programs, of course, were the short-term programs designed to put unemployed people to work on the government payroll. Recovery programs, as the name would suggest, are designed to help the two major sectors of the economy, agriculture and industry, recover. And then, of course, the reform programs were the permanent programs designed to reform the whole American economic system. We'll talk a little more specifically about some of these programs next time.